Hey Biology 400 students, this is Mr. Gales and I'm bringing you Central Dogma screencast session number three. This is all about DNA replication. Before we begin, I want to let you know that the learning targets for DNA replication can be found on page 53 in your unit packet. And then there is a related activity called the DNA replication tutorial that you can find on pages 55 to 58. That tutorial takes you through several animations that I think will be helpful in, in uh, building your understanding of DNA replication. Now also there's a summary diagram uh, for DNA replication on page 66. I'm going to be referencing that diagram quite a bit as we go through this presentation. It's actually on several of the slides. So it'd be useful for you to have that in front of you as you're taking your notes on, on DNA replication during the screencast. For those of you that like to do the reading in addition, uh, you can find some information about DNA replication on, in sections 8.4 and 8.5 in your textbook. That's pages 217 to 222. Now before we get into the screencast, before we get into some note taking here, I want to start off with an animation that will go through the entire process of DNA replication for you. And I think it would be useful for you to be introduced to some of the terminology um, that you're going to be learning about and see it kind of in context as a, a part of this animation. So for now, no notes, just sit back and watch this and kind of pay attention to some of the terms that you're going to be learning about. The replication of DNA begins at a sequence of nucleotides called the origin of replication. Helicase unwinds the double-stranded DNA helix, and single-strand binding proteins react with the single-stranded regions of the DNA and stabilize it. DNA polymerase III is the major enzyme involved in DNA replication. DNA polymerase III can only add a nucleotide to the three-prime end of a pre-existing chain of nucleotides, and it cannot initiate a nucleotide chain. Therefore, an RNA polymerase, called a primase, constructs an RNA primer, a sequence of about 10 nucleotides, complementary to the parent DNA. DNA polymerase III can then add deoxyribonucleotides to synthesize the new complementary strand of DNA. Because the two parent strands of DNA are antiparallel, they are oriented in opposite directions and must therefore be elongated by different mechanisms. The leading strand elongates toward the replication fork by adding nucleotides continuously to its growing three prime end. In contrast, the lagging strand, which elongates away from the replication fork, is synthesized discontinuously as a series of short segments called Okazaki fragments. When the DNA polymerase III reaches the RNA primer on the lagging strand, it is replaced by DNA polymerase I, which removes the RNA and replaces it with DNA. DNA ligase then attaches and forms phosphodiester bonds. The DNA is further unwound, new primers are made, and DNA polymerase III jumps ahead to begin synthesizing another Okazaki fragment. For simplicity, DNA polymerase III has been depicted as separate units, one acting on the leading strand and the other acting on the lagging strand. The current view of DNA polymerase III is that the two subunits function together with the DNA on the lagging strand, folding to allow the dimeric DNA polymerase molecule to replicate both strands of the parental DNA duplex simultaneously. Proteins other than DNA polymerase III are not shown. So, DNA replication looks like quite a complicated process, but what we're going to try to do here is to break it down. We're going to begin by talking about the kind of replication that occurs. What do we call that kind of replication? What does that mean? And then we're going to look at the really three steps to replication. We'll break it into three chunks and try to learn each chunk separately. Okay, so let's begin with looking at what kind of replication occurs. When Watson and Crick first proposed the structure for DNA in their 1953 article in, uh, in Nature Magazine, Nature Journal, um, they even implied that there would be a mechanism for replication based on the complementary base pairing. And that began a whole uh, additional type of research, how does DNA replicate? What was discovered was that DNA replication is semi-conservative. And what semi-conservative means is that for each new DNA molecule that's produced, there is one old strand, which is referred to as the parent strand, and one new strand of DNA. So semi-conservative, holding back one of the original strands 
as a new strand is being added. On the picture that you can see here, the parent DNA, the original DNA, is uh, shown in blue, and the new strands of DNA that are shown are in yellow. So at the bottom here, we have two new identical strands of DNA that will be produced. Uh, but again, one new strand and one old strand make up that DNA molecule. Now there's a really important experiment that was done uh, by a pair of researchers named Meselson and Stahl that showed definitively that DNA replication occurs semi-conservatively. So let's go through that for a few minutes. The Meselson and Stahl experiment provides evidence for semi-conservative replication of the DNA molecule, where the two parent strands serve as the template for synthesis of new strands. In this experiment, bacterial cells were grown for several generations on a medium containing a heavy isotope of nitrogen, M15. The DNA in these cells therefore contained heavy N15 nitrogen. The cells were then transferred to a new medium containing the normal lighter isotope, N14. At various times after the transfer, samples of the bacteria were collected. The DNA was then extracted and dissolved in a solution of cesium chloride. The samples were then spun rapidly in a centrifuge. When the cesium chloride is centrifuged at high speed, a concentration gradient is established in the tube. DNA molecules move in the gradient until they reach a place where their density equals that of the cesium. DNA containing N14 moved to a position in the gradient determined by its density. DNA containing N15 is denser than that containing N14, so it sank to a lower position in the cesium gradient. After one generation in N14 medium, the bacteria yielded a single band of DNA with a density between that of N14 DNA and N15 DNA, indicating that only one strand of each duplex contained N15. After two generations in N14 medium, two bands were obtained, one of intermediate density, in which one of the strands contained N15, and one of low density, in which neither strand contained N15. Messelson and Stahl concluded that replication of the DNA duplex involves building new molecules by separating parent strands and then adding new nucleotides to form the complementary strand on each of these templates. All right, so again, the way DNA replication occurs is in a semi-conservative nature. Now, that experiment, the Meselson and Stahl experiment, is another great example of scientific thinking and scientific experimental design, just like the Avery experiment and the Hershey uh, and Chase experiment were. Big idea that you need to understand is semi-conservative. One old strand, one new strand. And what that does is it preserves the genetic code from generation to generation as new DNA is produced for each new additional generation of cells. Now, our next main idea is going to be the first step in DNA replication. I mentioned that DNA replication is going to occur in three steps, at least the way that we're going to present it, three steps. Uh, step one is called initiation. Really, initiation is all about preparing the DNA template for the process of replication. One thing that you should note here on your diagram or on the picture that you see here are, are these areas that are referred to as the origins of replication. Origins of replication are the areas where the, where the enzymes involved in opening up the DNA molecule will land and begin their work. Now, that the, one of those enzymes is DNA helicase here. Helicase, of course, the ASE ending indicates that it's an enzyme, uh, unwinds the DNA double helix, there's where the name comes from, and it forms what's called a replication fork. And you can see that here. It, if you can imagine, DNA helicase is going to land here on this origin of replication, and it's going to push out sort of in both directions. So imagine here, it lands here, and you can see that there's the origin of replication right there. It's going to push out in both directions, one going this way, one going this way, and so what we end up with is kind of a bubble-looking structure, and then at, at the end of each bubble, you have what's called a replication fork. Um, in eukaryotic DNA replication, there are multiple replication forks along a DNA molecule, and that helps to speed up the process of DNA replication. Now, here's a, uh, a summary of DNA replication. Again, this is the diagram you have on page 66. And just so we can reference this as we're going through this, um, what we just looked at for step one, the initiation process here, was that helicases will unwind the parental double helix. That's the, the enzyme that unwinds the parental double helix. 
And then this wasn't mentioned before, but you can see on step number two, there are these special proteins that are called single strand binding proteins. And what they do is they prevent the double helix from winding back up. So they uh, help to keep the DNA separated so that the replication process can continue. All right, now what we're gonna see here, this is gonna be an animation. There are several animations as we'll go through this presentation. This animation will focus on the beginning of the second step of DNA replication, which is called elongation. Elongation is a fairly complex process that involves adding new nucleotides. So this is, this is really the majority of the process of DNA replication is going to involve this elongation stuff. So just take a moment and look at this animation um, and see what, what's going on here. We'll talk about it. You can see here that there's a, something called a primase that will land on here. There's an RNA primer. And then we can see another DNA polymerase and then a DNA nucleotide. We can see that beginning to move in this direction. Also notice the replication fork, parent DNA. Notice the five end and the three end. You should understand what that means. That refers to the on the 5N, there's a phosphate group exposed. On the 3N, there's the hydroxyl group exposed. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is explain to you what you're seeing here at the beginning of elongation, and then we'll push it forward and see what happens in the next step. Okay, so the first thing we saw in that animation was the action of something called RNA primase. And as you may have guessed, that is also an enzyme. RNA primase is a, an enzyme that adds something called a complementary RNA primer to each template strand as a starting point for replication. Uh, the enzyme that replicates DNA is unable to start its own new DNA molecule. So what it has to do is have a starting point, and that's what the RNA primer is. The RNA primer is the starting point for the new DNA molecule that begins. Uh, now, DNA polymerase is that enzyme. DNA polymerase reads the template strand. It reads the three prime end of the template strand. So it's reading from three to five on the template and it's adding new complementary nucleotides in a five prime to three prime fashion. Now at this point, those numbers that may be a little bit confusing, but as we move forward through this and as we do some more activities in class, I think that, that will begin to make more sense for you. Uh, DNA polymerase again is looking at the three prime end of the template strand and adding new complementary nucleotides five to three. Uh, now, one thing that's important to know that is that DNA that is synthesized in the direction of the replication fork is called the leading strand. So here on your picture that we have on, again, on, this is page 66 in your packet, the summary of DNA replication. Uh, the leading strand is this strand here. You can see the replication in the, in the direction of the replication fork. Notice the three prime end of the template. That's what the, the DNA polymerase will read, the three prime end of the template and add in the new DNA five to three, okay? So five, three, five, three, and so on. That's kind of crucial. Identify where the three prime end of the template is and you know you're gonna be putting in new nucleotides complementary to that going five to three towards the template strand. All right, what's coming next? Uh, this is what's gonna happen on the opposite side of the DNA molecule. So take a look at what we have going on over here. Uh, remember that the DNA is going to be read or new DNA will be added in in the five prime to three prime direction by reading the three prime end of the template strand. Okay, so what has to happen here, right? If, if this is the five end of the template, that means this is the three end of the template over here. And remember that our DNA polymerase cannot add in its own nucleotides without a starting point. It can't build its own chain. So again, we have to have that RNA primase come in, you see that right there, and add in a primer, and then the DNA polymerase can begin to work. Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Uh, really, the, the main idea of, of this step of elongation is producing the lagging strand. Uh, and there's a lot of text here, so if you wanna pause this for a moment and then kind of come back to it, we can talk through what this all means. Now, the DNA polymerase, remember, can add nucleotides in only in the five prime to three prime direction. And that has to do with the way that the nucleotides bond and the kind of uh, reaction that occurs to bond them in. Because of the anti-parallel nature of DNA, replication is going to occur in two directions as we saw on the animation. So again, an RNA primer is gonna be laid down on the opposite strand, which we call the lagging strand, and the new nucleotides are gonna be added five prime to three prime, moving away from the replication fork. 
that's one way that you can identify the lagging strand, that it moves away from the replication port. Uh, the segments of DNA that are going to be produced will be called Okazaki fragments. This is named after the scientist who first discovered them and figured out what they were. So if we look at the summary diagram that you have on page 66 again, we're looking here at the lagging strand. Now remember that we're going to be reading the 3' prime end of the template. So if this is the 5 over here on the template, that means 3 is going to be over here. And DNA polymerase cannot begin its own new strand, so it needs primase to come in. Primase will lay down an RNA primer right here. Uh, and then the DNA polymerase can begin to add in uh, some new DNA. Now, if you consider what happens, the replication fork is going to continue to open up as it pushes this in this direction. So every time the replication fork opens further, a new primer is going to need to be added. Okay, so I just mentioned that the replication fork will be extended. You can see what's going on here. As the new DNA is being added, this we're seeing here the leading strand. We know it's the leading strand because it's going in the direction of the replication fork. Uh, the replication fork is, is opening. And on that strand, the process just continues. So let's look at what that is all about. Um, you saw that the DNA is being unwound as the new DNA approaches that replication fork. Uh, that new DNA that's added is being added by DNA polymerase. And you can see that it was continuous. There was no breaks in that at all. So we, we would again say that replication that is moving towards the replication fork, as you can see here on this top part of this picture on page 66, is continuous. There's no breaks in it. It doesn't need to stop because down where you're going to see where the, the replication fork will open further, the DNA will just continue to move towards that replication fork, just moving in the same direction. Now here on the diagram, or on this animation, you're going to see that on the opposite strand, on the lagging strand, it's a different situation because as the DNA opens further, as the replication fork opens further on that top strand, we're going to need to add in a new primer because remember, DNA polymerase cannot begin its own chain, and it also has to be able to read from, it reads the three prime template, and it reads uh, uh, from three to five, and puts in new DNA five to three. Okay, so lagging strand. Um, on the top, on that animation that we saw, the new RNA primer is synthesized by the enzyme called primase that happens near the replication fork, and then the DNA polymerase comes in and adds new DNA. Um, moving away from the replication fork, that produces a second Okazaki fragment. And because there are fragments, there are breaks in the DNA, we say that the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. So again, we'll look at our summary diagram here. Uh, we're moving away from the replication fork. So if you can imagine this down here, this would have represented sort of the first time that we looked at replication. The replication fork would have opened up here further, a new primer is laid in, and the replication continues. As we move the replication fork and open it up even further, a new primer will have to be put in over here and the replication will continue in this direction. All right, final step, termination. See if you can figure out what's going on over here. We've got another kind of DNA polymerase which is gonna come in and it's going to replace that RNA primer. And then we have another enzyme DNA ligase which will fuse the, the break and the DNA backbone by creating a special kind of bond. Okay, so we have the, the action of two additional enzymes here. All right, so to uh, summarize that, a different type of DNA polymerase will remove the RNA primer and replace it with DNA. Now, really, this is going on sort of at the same time that replication is occurring, but I think it's easier for you to understand this as being sort of what, what wraps up the process. Now, the enzyme DNA ligase is going to be important because it's going to join the Okazaki fragments with the phosphodiester bonds that form the, the sugar phosphate bond on the, the backbone. And you can see here, if we are going to add in these uh, complementary bases here, you're going to have the breaks in the backbone where those Okazaki fragments are going to be joined. The enzyme ligase takes care of that by forming the phosphodiester bonds that you see here and here. Uh, the other thing that would happen, obviously, is it's each new DNA molecule is completed, it's going to be rewound up into its double helix form by the enzyme helicase. And then after replication is completed, you're ending up with two molecules that are each identical to each other. Uh, the idea of replication is for the DNA to, as closely as possible, make a, a perfect copy 
uh, of itself in the process. So to summarize, there are a couple of important facts that you should have here in terms of summary. The leading strand uh, has one primer on it. It's moving five prime to three prime in a continuous fashion. On the lagging strand, you have multiple primers and that's because it's moving uh, away from the replication fork. Uh, five prime to three prime discontinuous type of replication. Now in our cells, in humans, DNA polymerase adds 50 nucleotides a second as it's doing replication. So you can imagine anything that you do 50 times a second, you probably have a little bit of error built into that. Uh, prior to any kind of proofreading or checking, there are approximately one in every 10,000 bases that are mismatched because DNA polymerase is going so quickly. Uh, so what happens is there is a type of proofreading that the DNA polymerase enzyme can do. It checks its own work, and when it finds a mistake, it does something called excision repair. And you can see the picture of that here. Here's a normal DNA. Uh, the, if a, a damaged section or a mismatched section is found by the DNA polymerase, there are a group of enzymes that come in called endonuclease enzymes that remove the damaged section and another DNA polymerase will come in and, and fix that by adding in the appropriate bases. And of course, the, the close, the, the, the nick, so to speak, or the opening between the sugar phosphate backbone would then be fused by DNA ligase. Now, after excision repair is, is done, the rate of mutation, the rate of change in the DNA bases is one in 10 million. So excision repair is very effective in maintaining that, that high fidelity replication process. So to summarize, we have this final animation that sort of puts everything together. We're going to take a look at what we see here. We've got the RNA primase adding the primer. We've got the DNA polymerase adding in the nucleotides 5 to 3. This is on the leading strand. Notice on the top, on the lagging strand, we added in another primer there. Opened up the replication fork a little bit. A second primer gets added in and the process just continues. So lots of moving parts, pretty complicated, but as we get together in class, we'll be doing some drawing. We'll kind of work through all the detailed steps, make sure that you understand all the different aspects of DNA replication. So make sure you have some questions for us uh, so when you get to class, we can help you to answer those questions. And we'll see you again next time in biology.